Uh, thank you, Mark. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, sort of um, education wise, um, I, I did masters in mathematics. Why mathematics? Because the two things I was always good at was sport and sort of maths from the very, very young age. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I pursued it at the sort of highest level to the master's level, should have maybe gone for the PhD because I was offered that. Because maths really taught me uh, more about life and decision theory is actually about numbers. I was always good at numbers. What people don't understand is that when you're studying mathematics, at the top level, you don't see any numbers. It's all about theories. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, decision theory was my uh, a sort of favorite subject because if you think about it, we make decisions every day of our life. Some normal sort of everyday decisions, what do we eat, where do we go? Uh, but some very important decisions that could change uh, the, 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 the sort of society impact other people's lives. So it's very important to know decision-making isn't an impulse uh, sort of buying, decision-making is something that one has to take into consideration all aspects of it and really absorb, analyze before you actually speak out. I mean, I'd like to think that, you know, often, you know, God gave us uh, one mouth and two ears, so we should listen more than we talk. Sadly, it's not the case with everyone, but uh, I'd like to be often in the, in the background listening to other people's views and, and sort of understand what's happening. So, really uh, getting the right element of this you know, choice of the education, because I'm a great believer that we learn until we die. When we stop learning, uh, we, we are equivalent to being dead. And uh, you know, uh, I think far too many of us just sometimes think that we know it all. But you know, the more we know, the more we need to learn. You know, it's, it's a very important element that you teach the next generation, teach kids. I mentor lots of other young entrepreneurs and, you know, I take examples of my own mistakes and you know, where I went wrong. But, you know, for me, mentors were always important. When I was in my 20s, I met a, a gentleman called Douglas Lees, who was in his 80s. And he was uh, he had three offshore banks, St. Lucia, Barbados and Bermuda. And he was the only broker of Airbuses and Boeings in the world. And what was interesting to learn from Douglas is that even the biggest competitors in the world, Sometimes when they see the opportunity around a person, individual or company, they break their own principles and rules because Douglas explained to them that uh, selling aircrafts is a political game. Some, some countries and governments will only want Airbuses, others will want only Boeings. So there's nothing really you can do other than sell them what they want. So ultimately, you know, I've always been lucky and privileged from my own grandfather, who had a triple degree, a military academy, economics, law, spoke seven languages, you know, you know, born into that element of privilege, but always serving the underprivileged at the same time. You know, I had mentors in the family. I had the mentors in the workplace. And often mentors uh, are under sort of uh, probably played in the importance in other people's success. I talked earlier about an individual to succeed at the top level or to really uh, look at the infrastructure around them. Even last night at the hockey presentation, I was talking and the head coaches were talking about the importance of the right attitude of the parents, not just the kids, because parents often try to play their own life through the kids. And they mm -hmm. often try to push kids and break kids in the process. And I see far too many times the kids break a leg they have a really bad injury because they were overexhausted and not looked after. And the same is with business, with life, with relationships. We really need to understand the psychology about it. So, you know, all of that element of experience education led me to go into the you know, mergers and acquisitions. And recently, I also invested in a Swedish company, 6G Digital, and we are at the point of launching the first 5G network in Vietnam. And uh, we're also going to launch the fintech and that will lead to the national digital currency of Vietnam. Once we're done with that, I'd like to take the same concept to the Balkans and really introduce that into the likes of Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro and that part of the world to kind of technologically and economically bring these countries together. And after what really happened in the 90s and a very, very you know, terrible uh, sort of breakup of the former Yugoslavia, because I'm a great believer that the economical zone of the country that was very powerful in the 80s and early 90s, Yugoslavia was a, 
uh, when it comes down to sport in particular, you know, I think number five or number six uh, in the world of football, handball, basketball, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to see lots of that really happening. So through uh, technology, through sport, through sort of positive examples, uh, I really kind of want to move things uh, in that particular direction to make a long standing impact in what I do, because ultimately my take on life is that we have to create some sort of mini legacy. Again, I'm going back to the fact that we are temporary on this earth. Uh, however long we think we have lived, it's a, it's a very temporary in comparison to how long our human race has been around speculatively, you know, thousands of years, millions of years, doesn't really matter. So we are here for a short period of time. What can we do uh, that is going to be impactful? What can we do that's going to be legacy making exercise? And how do we inspire the next generation of both young professionals, our own uh, kids, and uh, those around the world that are looking for more inspiration, more motivation, and the reason to, to make an impact? Oh, very inspiring. Thank you. And uh, what what brought you to the into the sports industry in the first place? So uh, I grew up around sport. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I played handball at a, at a sort of really high level as a junior. Uh, then I, I came to London and all of my teammates ended up playing for the Croatian national team, winning the World uh, Cup and the Olympic gold. Uh, my father and grandfather were also involved in the world of football uh, as a as a young boy. From the age of two, the three of us had uh, a season tickets for our local club that played in the in the top league of Yugoslavian football at the time. And I used to travel with uh, our team to football matches across uh, former Yugoslavia at the time. So sport was part of my life as, as a young kid and as an adult. Uh, I think I could have pursued handball at the national level in the UK because we set up a team at university. We won the England national league and got to the uk cup final and i was drafted at the time to play for the for the team gb however the, the the sessions were up in loughborough and i was in the middle of my career development so i couldn't really commit to that otherwise i would have played for england probably at the london olympics that was one and only chance for the mm. england national team to play because they're not good enough but because london was hosting the olympics that was uh, the, the ticket was there anyway it didn't happen so then recently, as I mentioned, I, I went into the Formula E uh, racing with my partner, Edmund Chu. We looked at the ways in which how we can bring races to the Balkans and other parts of the world. And through really working closely with Edmund by taking some of the major Man City and, and sort of uh, top Spanish football clubs to Belgrade to look at the young kids like Stevanovic, who recently signed for Man City from Partizan Belgrade, Gvardio, they went to Leipzig for 21 million from Dinamo Zagreb. I started to get more and more sort of interest on the sort of investment and professional level. And then a year ago, I was contacted by uh, somebody who was very close to the biggest football club of Bosnia and asked whether I could come in as the new chairman uh, to take the club into the next 100 year history because it was at the junction of a 100 year anniversary but really kind of uh, uh, lacking the vision behind the next phase. I mean, I'm not going to say 100 years, but maybe next five to 10 years. And I took on that challenge uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, I didn't work in football. Uh, I come from a business and investment background, but I had a huge uh, love and passion for the world of sport and, and the huge sort of aspirations to see uh, and, and help and make an impact in the next sort of 10 to 20 years. So I took up that challenge. As I mentioned earlier, I brought in lots of sports tech into the club. I introduced the, uh, the, the sports tech companies such as Entourage, Block Sport, Results Sport, Home Fans uh, to the club and really kind of pushed it as the pioneer and innovator in the, in the space. But then I thought actually, considering you know, I'm gonna step down and look at the way in which we can bring the international sort of strategic investors into the club, I thought, actually, there's more to this. If I just stay at the helm of the club, I can only help one club. But if I step down and take myself into the advisory role of the club, then I can help the whole region. Because ultimately, uh, being involved with the Balkans Rugby League and looking at the way how we can relaunch 
the league. Uh, my ultimate goal is to eventually launch the Balkans Football League because I frankly believe that the power of Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, Montenegro, Macedonia uh, in the sort of union of the football uh, sort of league, uh, not comparing to Super League, uh, that was a huge debacle a few months ago, but a league that will really strengthen the power and influence of these clubs that produce amazing talent will be hugely, hugely beneficial to the whole region and the reconciliation process of the region. Because again, coming back to, you know, it's great to make money, it's great to be part of, uh, you know, big ventures and big projects, but ultimately, what is this that we can do in addition to that, that will have a, you know, a social uh, and economical impact uh, on the country and the region? So now I'm working very closely with the likes of Block Sport, Result Sport, Seiyu, Home Fans, all these amazing sports that companies and, and really uh, sort of educating uh, the likes of Red Star, Belgrade, Partizan, uh, and, and all the other big clubs there about the power of, uh, of social media, the power of uh, sports technology, the power of the organization and the world we live in. And that's become a, something that's, that's become a huge passion as well as interest of mine. And I'm really looking forward to the next phase. Great, great. And also, I think you've mentioned the, the biggest football club in Bosnia. What's the name? FK... So it's FK Željeznicar, which is a, a rival to the FK Sarajevo in Sarajevo that is owned by Vincent Tan of, uh, of uh, Cardiff City. So Vincent Tan is the first uh, formal investor into the Bosnian Super League by acquiring the controlling rights and stake in our you know, arch rival uh, FK Sarajevo that's you know, been there uh, for a long time. So um, you know, we are the most trophied. They're very close behind us with a couple of trophies less than us, and we'll see what uh, what happens in the next period. But you know, for me, coming into the world of Bosnian football, uh, my aim wasn't just to look at the single club. My aim was to look at the way in which we can uh, improve the league. Uh, we can improve the sort of uh, the positioning of the league on a global basis and really help some of these clubs that used to play top level European football in the 70s and 80s. Željezničar used to come all the way to the quarterfinals, semifinals of the top European uh, competitions at the time and really gave former Yugoslavia some amazing uh, players that played at the national level in some of the biggest clubs in Europe uh, to actually bring them back to the old glory. Uh, so uh, doing something for the club, but also more importantly, doing something for the league and the region is what drives me. Because uh, you know, if you just wear a single hat, then you become very biased about the club that you're part of. I know it's not a typical thing to say or do, but my motivation and my vision is much bigger than individual club or individual sort of uh, entity. Understandable, okay, thank you. And how do you see like the, the whole sports and the football industry environment in 10 years? Like uh, what, what, how do you envision it? So uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's, it's um, um, really entered during COVID uh, an interesting new phase. And, and, and I talked about the importance of data, the importance of mm -hmm. content, Uh, the fact that the content is the new king and the data is the new oil. Um, we have now seen that the fans have also uh, shown a huge uh, sort of embrace uh, a component towards the clubs who have started introducing some of the most innovative uh, and pioneering technologies in order to engage more with their fan base. So I think um, running a football club or running any sport club in the 2021 to 2030 will require a very different skill set to running it uh, before. I mean, I often hear in the world of techs that, uh, you know, some, some tech investors uh, would make statements such as, you never trust a tech guy who wears a suit that he knows much about technology uh, because he's just a salesman. You know, I, I would like to often say that, you know, whatever you wear, whether you wear a t-shirt and flip-flops or whether you wear suits uh, and ties, doesn't really matter. What matters is what comes out of your mouth. Because I think, you know, stigmatizing the way we dress 
and the way we carry ourselves is, uh, is, is in my view, the wrong thing to do because, uh, you know, I, I don't like to make judgments. I look at people um, in, in their full capacity. I listen to what they've got to say and I make my own judgment on them based on what they say, not how they look and what they what they do and where they come from. So uh, I think we, we are getting more and more uh, sort of um, interesting uh, backgrounds entering the world of sport uh, because it's really merging that sort of triangle of technology investment and sort of media, sport and entertainment. We are seeing a huge influx of a very, very uh, famous people entering into the world of sport uh, in the investment structures uh, as well because as the people that have experience, you know, going to the top level, they also have the kind of winning attitude and winning mentality, and they want to be part of the sort of winners uh, of tomorrow. You know, whether it's the unicorn companies or the the, the, the football clubs or sport and basketball clubs, they end up being multi-billion-dollar businesses. Doesn't really matter, and that that's very encouraging. And then we're seeing people and new emergence of uh, VC funds and hedge funds that are really starting to focus uh, in the sort of world of sport uh, like never before. And last but not least, we've seen other investment funds that have never traditionally invested into anything other than real estate or short and long-term equities, taking a huge interest into the fact that uh, if you give certain clubs a, a, a good pool of money and help them acquire the talent in the right way or invest in technology in the right way, you will see huge return on investment for your uh, fund, for your investors, your, your limited partners and general partners as well. So uh, I'm super excited about what the future holds in the next sort of five to 10 years. And the last but not least, as I mentioned before, Qatar next year, huge investments in the world of sport is in the Middle East, USA and Mexico 2026, huge trillions of dollars are investing in sports media entertainment out of the US for now years if not decades, and of course, Asia, 2030. My prediction, China will hold the World Cup in 2030. My prediction, China will not win the World Cup anytime soon. But President Xi did say uh, that he would like to see the Chinese nation one day win the World Cup. And you know, I wouldn't rule that out because finally they're starting to invest in football and in sport in the right way. I think five to 10 years ago, they were wasting money by attracting the famous players at the end of their careers for millions of pounds just to come and play to China, in China to promote it to the wider audience. I think they've embraced technology in the way they engage in the grassroots level, the youth academies and the top division clubs. And I think their know-how transfer from Europe mostly is now finally established in the right way. So I'd like to think that China at some stage will become a, one of the football superpowers because of their attitude, not because of the fact that it's 1.5 billion, but the attitude is very important in anything we do. If you have the winning mentality, but you are prepared to work hard, you're prepared to stay on course, you're prepared to be patient, you can go all the way. Okay, and because also I perceive like China as a government, which is, let's say, very aggressive when they're like, say, we, we want to go into this field. So maybe also if they go into the football now that they're just going to acquire some interesting players. Do you think it's like a threat for the Europeans or like, or how do you see maybe the, the impact of Asia or of China like in the future? Well, listen, as somebody who has lots of uh, uh, business partners, Asian business partners. Some are uh, born and raised in Canada, United States, United Kingdom, Hong Kong, but of Chinese or Asian origin, as well as those who were born and raised there. Uh, I'm in direct contact with the, the kind of Chinese and Asian investors and entrepreneurs, both here in London, but also over there. And uh, frankly, there's, uh, in my view, far too much propaganda against the Chinese in every aspect from politics, economics, trade wars, and, and also the world of sports and football. They have made mistakes. Uh, they have been foolish, in my opinion, uh, by spending too much money on the players. They weren't worth that much money. But they also felt even that money wasn't necessarily wasted because they raised the profile of football and sport in general. And when you raise the profile and you bring uh, it to attention, just like the Americans did. If you think about 30, 20 years ago, soccer, what they call football, was nowhere to be seen in America. 
But today in America, they have amazing league. They have some amazing players and coaches in America, and they're producing better and better quality footballers out of America before they move to Europe, where ultimately, you know, the, 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 everyone wants to be in Europe. Everyone wants to be in the UK, Italy, Spain, you know, the top five Bundesliga, top five leagues uh, of football are in Europe. And we can't deny that. I think China has learned its lessons. I think they're going about it in the right way at the moment. However, they're a long way away before they can make a, a sort of serious impact in the world's football. I would never see them as a threat to European football because I believe that uh, jointly uh, we can do so much more together rather than I think the blue ocean strategy of the collaboration of the 21st century is so much more positive than the red ocean strategy of the 20th century, which was all about competition, taking out your competitors, crushing them, destroying them in order to bring value to your shareholders and yourself. I'd like to think that we can do so much better, uh, uh, more jointly together. Thank you, yeah, makes sense. And uh, well, you, you already touched on that a little bit, but what projects are you currently working on? So, you know, my, my day to day involvement has a lot to do with uh, a, a sort of uh, being uh, on the on the sort of board of block sport and really uh, creating this uh, uh, know how transfer and, and the education of the clubs, federations, leagues and sports in the Balkans. I do that both with block sport and their sort of tokens, NFTs and the mobile app, as well as results sports, which as I mentioned before, I see as the Boston Consulting of digital strategy for the world of sport. And I think uh, its founder and CEO is incredibly uh, well regarded around the world. He sits on various panels. He works very closely with UEFA Grow program, which is all about the knowledge transfer uh, behind it, the sort of best practices of the world of football around the world. Uh, a great sort of, uh, uh, call it a customer base from the likes of Borussia Dortmund, Juventus, Man City, uh, and also other sports as well. So, you know, my two most important, I would say, day-to-day -day, uh, sort of uh, uh, ventures and projects are to do uh, with sort of pushing as a chief strategy officer of Results Sport and the advisory board member of the Block Sport to kind of open doors and educate the next generation. I'm also a great uh, fan of education and educational curriculum. So we are now working with a number of universities in the Balkans to bring the sports uh, technology and sports management in a new way into some of the universities and create bachelor's and master's courses as well as the certif certification courses. And of course, my ultimate uh, goal, which I'm working behind the scenes is the launch of the Balkans Football League Uh, off the back of the Balkans Rugby League that uh, I'm in the process of sort of uh, relaunching with some of my partners from Australia and from the United Kingdom. So these are the kind of uh, really, I would say, uh, very important uh, ventures and projects that uh, I've been enjoying working on. Wonderful. And uh, which, which effect did COVID-19 had on you, your ventures and well, the, the sports industry as a whole? So um, I think COVID has, as far as the sports concerned, uh, possibly after the everyone being sort of having adapted to the to the new norm, uh, was very very positive. I think we've seen a huge surge in the emergence of sports tech uh, industry as a whole, and we've seen the creation of new revenues. Uh, so personally, uh, we were kind of ready for this recession by the fact that we've been in business for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years as, as a sort of investment group. So we knew that when the recession happens, and obviously you can never predict the severe impact COVID had on our lives around the world, uh, but we also, uh, in every downturn, there's, there are huge opportunities. So I think as we slowly emerging out of the COVID-19 sort of uh, global pandemic in the forthcoming months, maybe up to a year or two, Uh, we will see some huge, huge winners. And I'd like to think that, uh, that the sort of football club, the football clubs, uh, and the sort of individual athletes uh, will, will sort of end up uh, being uh, sort of in the new waters, uh, very 
uh, uh, different waters to the ones of a few years ago, but uh, in a very, very positive light and with a positive effect. Wonderful, like recovering from the shock. <laughs> awesome. That's way. And uh, yeah, I think we have time for one more final question before we have the next session in, in two minutes. Um, what advice would you give to the young generation of sport management and sport industry and students? You know, a very simple advice. Obviously, uh, you know, there's some amazing uh, university courses out there, both bachelor's, master's and doctorate. And I'm sure I can't add much more to the, to the textbooks out there, but uh, I would like to encourage them all to embrace uh, this new norm of uh, digitalization and really fully understand what uh, data and content mean today for the way in which you manage an athlete, if you are an agent, the way you manage a club, if you're a club CEO or chairman, or if you are sitting anywhere between technology, sporting industry, and the investment world, how you really kind of penetrate it in the best possible way, and how you bring value to the entire sort of ecosystem. I think the ecosystem of the sporting industry uh, is, is fast, rapidly changing, and uh, for the better. And I think it's going to open up many more opportunities to the young individuals that really want to embrace themselves into the world of sport. And today we have truly become a global village. So you can really travel the world like uh, a, a sort of never before once the restrictions are down and be able to engage and pick brains and ideas from those around the world that are doing some uh, extraordinary things uh, wherever they might be. Great, wonderful. And for you perf uh, personally, what, what's next for you? Like how can we as a unit maybe so support you or uh, what's, what's, what's your way? So my immediate next is an uh, imminent trip to the Balkans, to Belgrade, to sort of uh, really explore the next phase of all the projects I'm working on. Uh, with UNIT and what you guys are doing, I'd love us to sort of sit down and engage and see and find the ways in which we can support each other and we can see how, uh, what is through the power of education, power of uh, digital media, power of, uh, you know, conference Uh, speaking platforms that you are putting together, maybe master classes for the sort of next generation. And you know, the, the thing we all have something to give and something to offer. I'm a great believer that you know it's very, very important to pass down that knowledge that we have the mistakes that we have made, the, the sort of uh, challenges that we have overcome uh, to those that are facing them right now and those who will be facing them tomorrow. So uh Mark, I'd love to sort of continue the conversation and find the sort of uh, synergies between us. And Thank you very much, Samir. I really enjoyed your session, also this interview. And uh, yeah, that's that's what we do. What's important right now to educate people like of the blockchain. What, what can it do? Like where's the future heading? Yeah.